Thank you, Dave. Um, delighted to, uh, to be here. This is a, a subject near and dear to my heart. And uh, this is the good old days, uh, if you're a physician, uh, good old days spelling out God. This was the American Medical Association's first code of ethics. Um, I didn't know that it actually applied to patients, but an ethical obligation of the doctor was to tell his patient, you got to listen. Really quite inspirational. Um, and uh, just, I talked to my paper about it being a full century, okay? It is a hundred years ago that it took a Supreme Court decision, Supreme Court decision, saying a doctor had to tell a patient what they were doing before they did it. It's not informed consent. That's it. I did surgery on this woman to remove her ovaries. She would have objected had I told her what I was doing. It was my ethical obligation as a physician to save her, and so I didn't tell her what I was doing. And that went to the Supreme Court. It was not until the 1950s, a half century ago, that's our 1950s family, that informed consent, again, a court decision, they don't teach this in medical school, a court decision said you have to get informed consent. It was not until the 1970s, 20 years later, that they said, oh, the informed consent has to be in plain English. And so now we have one hospital doing kind of plain English sharing care plans in the year 2012, and I want to be a little bit fearless here. I predict by the year 2062, this will certainly be commonplace. Well, person-centered care is very trendy. Uh, and everybody makes diagrams. So, of course, person-centered care in one uh, uh, regard is, in fact, the ethical obligation of the clinician to really listen to the person, and that's great. On the next to the right, you have the Institute for Patient and Family-Centered Care. Uh, going, continuing to go clockwise, you have uh, two researchers, Epstein and Street, and then to the left, you have um, the chronic care model from Wagner Modified. That clear? So. What I tried to do, since I cannot draw pretty pictures or pretty much any picture at all, is to try to rethink this. And we've got a lot of built up ways of thinking about patient-centered care that are built up from another era and that we need to stop and rethink. So I'm going to give you a, a, a taxonomy of my own. It's going to be kind of in, in two different ways. One is looking at how you can do this redefine the relationship, rules for setting up patient-centered care, and then some role models. And I think that a lot of what Dave talked about would fall under, under the rules kind of way of, of different systems to set up. And then I'm gonna look into it more, particularly in redefining the relationship, teasing apart different ways we talk about patient-centered. We confuse different models. So when we talk about consumerism, in consumers, it's caveat emptor. That's why we're not so happy when your doctor finishes e examining you and he says, you know what, I wrote you a prescription and you can fill it right outside here with my receptionist. That makes some of us a little bit uneasy. Or, you know what, I think you need an x-ray and that's right, out, right outside the receptionist. I remember a study in the 1980s that showed that physicians had x-rays gave them about eight times more than physicians without x-ray machines in their office, and the response to the American Medical Association was, maybe they are meeting an unmet need. That's true. Maybe they are. Maybe that's why we have all those proton beam machines and all those MRI machines. Maybe it's an unmet need, or maybe not. Ethical is very different, and the consumer as a clinical partner is different. Ethical is about human rights and autonomy. And there's a tremendously uh, informative book Jack Wenberg recommended to me many years ago called The Silent World of Doctor and Patient by Jay Katz, a, um, a psychiatrist immigrant from uh, uh, Nazi Germany who actually was an ethicist who worked on the Tuskegee uh, uh, experiments in the, in the aftermath trying to make sure that never happened again. The Silent World of Doctor and Patient and said so we need to go from caring custody to genuine informed consent. The second is the consumerism. Uh, give the lady what she wants, which is not a 
website motto by someone who says that women take care of medical decisions, but is Marshall Field, the head of the department store uh, in, in uh, Chicago, the famous department store in the 19th century. Uh, he had that motto. And clinical, the individual experience of care as a legitimate outcome were more than a bundle of symptoms. So the ethical, everybody's seen this with the Institute of Medicine about care that's responsive. And the cartoon says, when we want your opinion, we'll give it to you. So we're aware of kind of this ethical uh, aspect. This is, an, and I think this has been updated, Mike has it now. This is a, um, a poll by the, then called the Foundation for War Medical Decision Making in 2008, which totally shocked me, right? Because these are doctors self-selected. They're going to be answering a poll. They're doing it via the internet with Harris Associates. Presumably, this is a little bit more progressive subset of physicians. And you ask them, should patients be informed? And up to almost a quarter of them say no. Uh, you ask them whether they should even at the bottom there have you know, shared decision making for lifestyle changes. And 40% of them say no. The AMA code of ethics that I quoted to you kind of as a joke was from 1847. This is from 2008. Are you kidding me? And patients get the hint, whether they would ask questions or discuss preferences, et cetera, or whether they would express disagreement, right? I don't want my doctor to think I'm a difficult patient, although sometimes I tell him what I do for a living and it comes up. Oh, I work on quality of care and inform patient decision making. Why? So the other way of looking at this, again, we're going to go redefine the relationship rules and role models. We have to go from the exam room to the board room, right? And this says, this is very simple, this says, doctor, focus on the patient's agenda and complete the patient's agenda. And this is by uh, Richard Frankel, and who's a PhD, and he and a colleague, Howard Beckman, are the ones who did the study in the 1980s that said, how long can a patient talk on average before the doctor interrupts him? Anybody remember what the statistic is, roughly? It's about 18 seconds, I think, but they're very close. And just for curiosity, they did an update. How long will the patient talk on average if they're uninterrupted? A minute, a little, just a little longer than that, 90 seconds. And if you think of that, think of sitting right next to your doctor staring at you and whether most of us would run out of steam pretty, pretty quickly. Very simple. Focus on the patient's agenda, complete the patient's agenda. Now I'm going to switch from the ethical to the consumer. This is talk a while back. Consumerism is an old rubric in healthcare. It comes up every few years. It actually goes back to the 70s. This is J.D. Power. People are desperate for information. People are competent to make decisions. People can recognize good and bad care and service. It's pretty profound because it says, you know what, that applies to healthcare too. And there was a study I saw recently, HCAPS, which is the Consumer Assessment of Health Plans and Systems, Right, validated out the wazoo by health services researchers, goes back more than 20 years, and Yelp. People on the internet, and yet, they're concordant. What does that tell us? So, oh, this didn't go, build, basically we need economic data. It's the broader business trends. If you look at what Joseph Pine from Harvard has said about the mass customization. To me, mass customization is a business synonym for evidence-based medicine. Mass customization is, right, you can have, I'm building cars on an assembly line, but yours can be a color you want, with a package you want, with the trimmings that you want, and everything else like that. Or what Amazon does. Evidence-based medicine is clinical studies, but I customize it for you. As a physician, I look at your preferences and values. I look at your individual clinical symptoms and signs. And the experience economy is, yes, it's Disney, but it's beyond that. It's, if you don't want to be a commodity, what is my experience with you? Those basic business trends apply to us as consumers. And in fact, 
the experience economy is starting to be seen. This is a poll from the Barrel Institute as a priority by hospital folks. We're starting to see the economic. But what's, what's more difficult is the patient is clinical data source. Right? The ethical we all get, the consumer is part of our society, the patient is clinical data source. I'm sorry some of the uh, graphics do not seem to be showing up, but this is from patients like me. And they use rigorous patient information for people with Lou Gehrig's disease and other conditions. What happened when I took that drug? What happened to me when I had versus different experiences? Very critical kind of patient as data source legitimized as these revolutionary outliers on the web who then hire a PhD, right? So what are you showing? The subtext here is that intellectually rigorous and believable results can come not just from within the system, from academic medical centers, but from things done by patients, from patient reported data, from patient involvement, that patients as a partner cause clinical outcomes that we could not achieve otherwise. Well, some people are taking this a little bit far. This is from the Journal of Biomedical Informatics. And as you can see, this is how your average patient, if you're Hugo Campos, would uh, track your back pain. The thing, this is what happens to me when I took my drugs, what my symptoms were, my morphine, my activity. This is sort of amusing, except when you step back and say, I turn this over to a couple of web developers with infographic uh, abilities, and this becomes an Apple iPhone app with an easy to understand graphic interface. From the Journal of Biomedical Informatics to your pocket to your exam room. And although we're not talking about physician training today, what happens when you confront your doctor with this data? How does he interact? How can your physician or better yet your team interact with this, and we need to give more support to physicians to be able to help them interact. So again, there's a lot of, uh, of uh, medical literature that says patient experience improves health outcomes, patient adherence, process of care, clinical outcomes, business outcomes. The thing is, when you look at the rules, can you do it? So the government put out rules for ACOs, and I don't usually do this, but I went through all 340 some pages of the PDF looked at the rules that had to do with patient engagement and tried to translate them into English. Um, I grew up speaking fluent bureaucraties. I, I grew up in Washington, D.C., the only city in the world where people will promulgate out in the streets during the day. And uh, I actually had a job where I was translating the Federal Register into English in my first job. Um, uh, I'm, I'm very proud of, of that bureaucratic ability. And what you can do is take some of the rules and put them into English. What do they mean? They mean evaluate health needs, engage in shared decision making, coordinate care, track patient self-reported mental health. There are a series of steps, clear steps, clear actions to carry out the kinds of things Dave was talking about. And I go into more detail in my paper. The last part is, Role models. We've redefined the relationship. We've looked at the rules. Can we really do this? Now, remember, we're talking about from the exam room to the boardroom. And for all of you who have been to quality improvement meetings, there tends to be what a, a colleague of mine called science fair stories, right? People make reports about, look what I did. And they're great. Like, so the one in Abington Memorial about printouts in the hospital, that's a terrific science fair story. Great project at one hospital. The question is, can you transform an entire hospital, an entire health system? Can you be patient-centric in a sophisticated manner that goes beyond compliance and education thinking? And you are starting to see this. So these are some science fair stories. 
But I took a look at University of Pittsburgh Medical Center's orthopedics program and Mercy Clinics, and they went beyond that. Not perfect, a long way to go. Mercy Clinics, everybody's heard of health coaches, but they do the behavioral change interviewing, right? They train a group of RNs in behavioral change. What are you ready to do? What are your goals? That's how you go into that. They combine it with disease registries on the patients. They're using now some shared decision tools. They have financial ROI. They also want to get new patients. They listen to the patient's goals. You start to have the ethical, the clinical, and the consumer all come together. And I spoke to them the other day, and they're totally retraining their nurses. And this is interesting. They brought in their nurses. They've had this successful program. They've gotten awards all over the place. And they asked the nurses, what do you do? What do you do? What's your job? And they said, like anybody would who was trained within the healthcare system, my job is patient education. And they said, no, your job is self-management support. Education is what we do to people. I am educating you, translates to, if I talk to you long enough, you can understand that what I'm telling you is the right way to think. Self-management support is very different. At University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, this is a small miracle. I don't want to cast aspersions on any particular profession, but the phrase patient-centered and orthopedic surgeon do not usually go together. And yet, they are extraordinarily patient-centered. They do a formal process they call shadowing to follow patients and other stakeholders to see what are the glitches in the system and how do we change it. They have clinical results. They have financial results, both. They treat patients ethically as customers because they are at University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, which put the profit in not-for-profit. And they also have patients as clinical partners. They're doing orthopedic surgery. If you don't have the patient's goal, what are you doing? So there is the new paradigm. This is from Contra Costa Regional Medical Center. We've discovered that there is no technology or intervention that can match the acceleration of change by putting a patient or family member in the room. The acceleration of change. You heard Dave talk about the same thing. It is profoundly threatening to any of us to have to partner with someone who doesn't know as much as we do. And yet, it is profoundly positive for the results that we say we're there for, which is healing. So in this new info medicine world, my, my, my term for where we're going, clinical information to improve expert decisions, you've heard about that. And by the way, Warner Slack, who Dave mentioned, is famous for saying, any doctor who can be replaced by a computer should be. He said that in the 1970s when doctors were afraid in the 1970s they were going to be replaced by a computer. And of course he's right. If you can't do something better than the computer, you shouldn't be doing it. It has a better memory than you do, but it doesn't have the judgment you do. We're going to have clinical and economic information going to other stakeholders, shared with patients, new dimensions, and patient generation, generate information shared with experts and not. Maybe I'm on patients like me and I don't tell my physician. What does that mean? What does it mean when I can generate evidence-based, sophisticated clinical algorithms for myself without a doctor? Apart from saying that any doctor has himself treats himself as a fool for a patient, what does that mean that I can be that kind of clinical partner? Well, we're going to have information overload. We don't talk about that much, but in fact, this info medicine overloads the system. How are we going to frame the choices? We know that if we put things in different language, uh, people will make different decisions. That's how we get you to choose your cell phone plan, by framing it a certain way or writing our menus a certain way. We're going to have to negotiate a new relationship. Can we have high tech and high touch? It's a huge change. Who's ready for interdependence? Nothing about me without me. 
and of course, populations versus individuals. And by the way, if you're a partner, you're going to have to bear the consequences of your decisions. Huge societal issues that go from our, for patients as well as physicians, to negotiate within an ethical, economic, and clinical framework. Not easy, but we have to think about it conceptually the right way, not in these mushy cliches about shop for yourself or, you know, by God, I can make my own decisions. We need to think sophisticated ways about this. A few bumps on the way. This is the patient saying, according to medweb.com, you should be making an incision above the third rib, not the second. And of course, a New Yorker cartoon, how's the self-diagnosis coming? Specific steps are important. This is from the Institute for Patient and Family-Centered Care, and it looks at the different levels. Uh, I'll, I'll leave this to you to look at later. And this is a quote I have been using since I started talking about this in 1997. It is from Edward George Earl Bulwer Lytton, and for those of you who are old enough to remember newspapers, anybody here remember the Peanuts comic strip and A Dark and Stormy Night when uh, Snoopy was writing? Edward George Earl Bulwer Lytton was the author of that terrible phrase, A Dark and Stormy Night, a Victorian novelist who was also a member of parliament. But this is the key. We are not talking about health care reform. That's nonsense. We're talking about a revolution, which is a transfer of power. And the reason physicians don't like a lot of what's happening with quality measurement and management and all the rest of this is because it is, in fact, a transfer of power. We have a, a tension. And I, you know, these are, these are, clinicians are good people. I've tried to ask myself, why is there such resistance? We have a tension between autonomy and accountability. How much autonomy is appropriate? How much accountability is appropriate? We change, right? We change the paradigm without noticing it. 15 years ago, if you walked into your doctor's office with an internet printout, he might have said to you, I'm not going to talk to you if you do that. Today, he might think it, but he would never say it. That's a paradigm change without legislation, without headlines. The paradigm change is autonomy is being taken away from physicians and they are getting more accountability. It is difficult and it's not taught in med schools because the people who run the med schools look in the mirror in the morning and they say the cream rises to the top, the system is good, smart people are in charge. And what we are doing with the patient, with the person-centered movement, with the person-centered movement, is bringing a revolution that's both clinical, psychological, and economic to the world of medicine. It is not an easy revolution. And this quote is from Albert Schweitzer. Each patient carries his own doctor inside him. They come to us not knowing that truth. We are at our best when we give the patient, we have the doctor who resides within each patient a chance to go to work. Wisdom from Albert Schweitzer. I'm going to end with this from Antoine de Saint-Zupéry, as for the future, your task is not to foresee, but to enable it. Take a look closely and think about what Dave embodies. You had someone get up here who talked about his own experience and his relationship with his physician, certainly an ethical relationship. You heard him talk repeatedly about his consumer attitude, about shopping. And you certainly heard him talk about being a clinical partner. You heard him talk about what happens to him at the doctor's office in the exam room. And you heard him talk about his work with health systems in the boardroom. And you heard him say that increasingly, he is no longer unique. As for the future, your task is not to foresee it, but to enable it. Thank you very much.